Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome back for the third time. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, the third time, Dr. Judith Curry. She is the author of a new book called Climate Uncertainty and Risk, Rethinking Our Response. Judy, welcome back to the Power Hungry Podcast. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to join you again. So your book has been out now a couple of months, um, and uh, it's called, as I said, Climate Uncertainty and Risk, Rethinking Our Response. Uh, you've been on the podcast before, but guests on this podcast, I think you remember, introduced themselves. So you've been on here once, but imagine you've got 30, 60 seconds, you walked into a room, you don't know anyone, introduce yourself, please. Okay, I'm Judith Curry. Um, I spent most of my career in academia, most recently at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where I was chair of School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences for 13 years. I'm currently president of Climate Forecast Applications Network. I'm proprietor of the blog Climate Etc. at judithcurry.com and author of a new book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk. Very succinct. Well done. At a girl. Um... And you're also on Twitter, so we get this out of the way, at Curry uh, J.A., at Curry J.A. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, just tell me, I, you know, I've been reading your book. Uh, give me the your pitch. What is this new book about? We've talked before on the podcast. We've talked about climate science, media, et cetera. What is this book and what do you help to what do you hope to achieve with it? Well, the whole climate science issue and the policy response has been squeezed into this little tiny box, you know, with everybody bouncing around inside the box, dotting I's and crossing T's and threatening anybody who tries to go outside the box. Well, I blow the lid off the box. I look at all the other stuff <laughs> that people, the inconvenient things that people are trying to shove under the rug. I look at the uncertainties. I look at the controversies. I look at why we disagree. Um, both in the science and the policy response. I talk about, you know, how the politics of this has really torqued this in a very unfortunate way. Um, I talk that the middle part of the book, I look at, speculate about what we can expect in the 21st century in terms of climate. I mean, the, the climate models are deeply flawed in terms of giving us a reliable perspective on this. So I speculate, you know, on a whole range of possible outcomes, including plausible worst cases. And the third part of the book is the most important one, really. It's risk and response. And this is where I talk about how we've fundamentally mischaracterized climate risk and how we've <laughs> fundamentally mismanaged our response and I use principles from a variety of risk science disciplines to put together a menu of some other approaches that we can take that make more sense when you're dealing with a very complex, deeply uncertain um, problem with conflicts of values and political disagreements in play. So, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's a very, different approach and it's a it's a very integrated approach to this very wicked problem that i think can lead us on a path to doing sensible things and setting our path towards a prosperous and safe 21st century i that's a good summary thank you um in, in looking at the book though and as i've been going through it um and I don't mean this as a slam, but we talked about it right before we started recording. You said this was written uh, or published by an academic press, Anthem Press, um, and it's heavily footnoted. And I got to say, I love me some footnotes, right? I'm, I you know I footnote all my books. It's a laborious process. Uh, so, well, this is a, a, a kind of a geeky question. Did I, I could tally them all up here, but about how many footnotes are in this book? Roughly, about 1,500. 1,500. 1,500 <laughs> in... Uh, 239 pages. So you have uh, you have your references here, which I think you you made clear you wanted to publish this book before we started. You said you wanted it published by an academic press, that it was peer reviewed, and everything here you've stated is all fully cited. Um, but still, I mean, the fundamental issue that, and we've talked about this before, is that 
we're seeing this lack of robust debate or even any debate, really. And that uh, most recently, John Clauser, who won the Nobel Prize in physics uh, in uh, just in June, in, in August, had a, a speech, a presentation to the International Monetary Fund that he was canceled because he's not towing the line on the the catastrophist orthodoxy, if I can use that that phrase. I mean, it seems rather than getting better, the, the, rather than the debate getting a slightly more open, it's getting even yet more constrained. Or or is that fair? How how is the, how have things changed? Oh, that's to- correct. I mean, we'll go back to the little box again. Yeah. Um, you know, and the reason it's all been shoved into a box, everybody has to agree, because the pers- the, the oversimplified analysis that our brilliant policymakers have made is that we need global collective action on this problem. And in order to get there, everybody has to agree. (laughs) So, you know, so so there's huge motivation with that framing of the problem to nuke anybody who disagrees. I mean, even, so you even said when, you, I just want to make sure you said oversimplified analysis. Is that is that what you the, the phrase yeah. that you use? Yeah, right. Yeah. So we have to nuke any <laughs> nuke anyone who disagrees. But that, that I think that seems to be the right uh, right description as well. That there we will not brook dissent, right? But is that exactly? So you've talked about this in academic terms because that's where you come from. This and I'd come at it from as a more I, I would say just a more general reporter approach. But if I were to say, well, what's driving this, I would say it's money, right? That there is a lot of money at stake here for uh, various subsidies under the Inflation Reduction Act. This is one of the big drivers, of course, of the renewable energy rollout, right? There's massive subsidies for wind and solar at at, at hand. So they there must not be any controversy about this. Otherwise, the sub that you stop the flow of the money. Is, it, uh, um, is that an oversimplified analysis? It's an oversimplified analysis. Okay. I think- have to go back to the uh, 1980s and the UN Environmental Program. There was a big drive for non-governmental world control, you know, through health, environment, and all these issues. And they keyed on climate change as, you know, the issue to get us there. And, you know, we had a climate change treaty in 1992, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. This was before the temperature even started warming in a significant way. And we couldn't, you know, the U.S. even signed on to that treaty. So from the very beginning, you've had the the policy card way out in front of the scientific horse. And this is a UN agenda. It's um, degrowth. It's anti-capitalism. It's anti-democratic. And in, in order to enforce this, they amp up the alarm. I mean, you know, the, the worst rhetoric, I mean, apart from Extinction Rebellion or something like that, comes from you and officials. You know, global boiling, code red, you know, all of this kind of stuff over a slow creep of warming. And the agenda is to kill off the fossil fuel industry. They don't like that. They don't like nuclear either. Um, you know, so so this is a real, it, it's a clash of values. And there was a recent survey of university climate scientists, and they asked them a bunch of questions, and a majority of them were in favor of degrowth. Not, not green growth, but degrowth. <laughs> okay, so you can see the perspectives of these people. I mean, it's not necessarily about money. There is certainly an element of, you know, follow the money and all this, but that there's a whole worldview and an ideology behind all this. That's so that's interesting, I guess. So maybe what I, I mean, in your replies, I'm don't, not going to argue with it at all. That is more on the science kind of policy side. I guess what my, my point about the money and the subsidies is on the deployment side, right? On the the amount of money that's available for the mitigation side, right? Which was where there's staggering numbers now, hundreds of billions of dollars, whether it's electric vehicles or solar or wind or hydrogen or carbon yeah. capture. I mean, it's just a staggering amount of money. I think it's the biggest uh, corporate giveaway in American history, and there's no second place here. But but your your points are more on the policy side about this ideology that's driving this alarmism, I guess, to put it. Is that is that a fair way to characterize it? Yes, yes. Oh, there's definitely money in play. And, you know, Warren Buffett was very cynical. I mean, he was an early investor in wind power. Sure. Not that he liked wind power, but he saw with all these subsidies and whatever, I'm going to make money. He's no dummy. 
The only, re the only reason to build wind turbines is to collect the tax credits, right? He said that very clearly, right? That that was his his famous line. Um, okay, well, so I live in Texas, and let me tell you, it's it feels a little apocalyptic. And let me just well, my climate. What is my view on climate change? Climate change is a concern, and I think it rhymes with what your book says. Climate change is a concern. It's not our only concern. Right? So I, I, I not that I don't favor action on climate change. Is that it's a concern, but we have to balance our action on that against other other concerns. And I think if I were to boil down what I see in your in your book, you're saying something somewhat similar. And I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but it's been stinking hot here in Texas this summer, Judy. Oh, I mean, uh, it's just been, and I'm used to the heat. I've lived in Texas. I'm from Oklahoma. Okay, so here's the question: the Is it possible that the Hunga Tonga volcano eruption in January 2022? is in part responsible for the weather or this hot weather that we're seeing now. Okay, first off, Texas is an anomaly. If you look at the average temperatures over the summer so far for the US, we're slightly below normal. I mean, you look I at the- I have to move then is what you're saying. Oh. <laughs> Eastern US has been cool. So, you know, Texas is just bad luck. Um, I did my, my latest blog post that's up, looks at what is causing all this more on a global level. And it looks Tonga Tonga, and it looks at the, the ship fuels, and it looks like the long wave and the radiation budget at the top of the atmosphere. It looks at the surface energy balance. It looks at the internal modes of climate variability. It's a very comprehensive discussion of what's going on. To get back to Hunga Tonga, um, <clears throat> Hunga Tonga, usually volcanoes spew um, particulates into the atmosphere, which in the stratosphere, and that has a cooling effect. Well, Hunga Tonga spewed only a little bit of sulfate and a substantial amount of water vapor into the stratosphere. So right now in the summer hemisphere, it looks like the effects of Hunga Tonga on the radiation balance are canceling out. You know, the long wave and the short wave are canceling out. But if you go to the winter hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, we are seeing the effects of Hunga Tonga because the long wave infrared effects are dominating. And you see it in an, um, this is part of the circulation pattern that's giving us an early ozone hole and is giving us the uh, low extent of the Antarctic sea ice this winter. So Hunga Tonga, and we may see a bigger effect of Hunga Tonga in the northern hemisphere during our winter. So that, but if you're interested in it, you know, check out my blog, judithcurry.com. I've got a whole, whole long post on all this. I see. Well, I just found it. It was posted August 14th. I was looking at your other blog post. It's with Jim Johnstone and Mark uh, Jelinek, I guess. Is that, that's the one you're talking right, about? Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I didn't have time to look at that one. I was also looking at the uh, post you did on the Held versus Montana lawsuit, which I want to talk <laughs> about as well. Okay. So I just want to read back. So you're saying I can't blame the hot weather in Texas on Hunga Tonga. No, it's unfortunate circulation patterns. Okay. Um, so, well, and that's it, but isn't, <laughs> I guess even me even asking this question, as I say it, am I, this is part of the issue, right? If, well, why can't we blame this on that? Is it this, of course, be due to that, that there's, I, like everybody else, I'm like, well, she, tell me the cause, right? Oh, or is this, okay, you know, and, and the Bill McKibbins of the world will gladly say, oh, well, see, there you go. You know, you guys in Texas, or in fact, Mark Goodell in the pages of the New York Times, kind of, he, he said, in fact, in his piece, promoting his new book, yeah. <laughs> that this is, oh, this is like, you're getting payback. Now, now this is, you're getting, Texas is getting paid back for being a bad guy, right? That this is like, this is the cause. Is this, exactly. is this part of the whole problem? Well, well, okay, here's the issue. We're talking about a very complex, chaotic, nonlinear system. And not only do we have a chaotic atmosphere, it's coupled to a chaotic ocean and it's subject to ex, you know, changes in external forcing. And the mathematicians you know, call this pandemonium. It's even beyond chaos. And trying to unravel causes and effects you know, is, is you know, not impossible, but it's not simple. You know, you can't do this by waving your arms. And like the analysis in my blog, you know, it un unravels a lot of things. And 
it gives you a sense of how difficult it is to attribute any specific things to any specific forcing. It's, it's very challenging. Well, okay, so fair enough. And yeah, you have 17 figures in this uh, in this uh, posting here. Um, but I guess maybe I'm my my desire for that simple solution is reflective of this kind of broader societal desire. Well, of course, this means that, and therefore we have in broad terms the way I see a lot of the climate apocalypse, uh, apocalyptic analysis. We've sinned. Now we're suffering and we're going to pay the price. And therefore we have to repent, right? That this is, there's a lot of kind of Christian echoes of what, you know, sin and redemption here, right? And is that part of the narrative as well? That why this narrative is so strong? That this is the policymakers back in the 1990s wanting a simple cause and effect and a simple fix. And it was also the hubris that they can control the climate by, you know, eliminating fossil fuels. So it's looking for a simple solution and just a total lack of humility in thinking that we can actually control this. So, you know, it's just, you know, a human failing. <laughs> it's not surprising. That's why we have scientists to sort all this out. But when the scientists become political activists and become active in trying to cancel anyone who disagrees with them, then the whole thing falls apart and we end up with nonsense like we're currently facing. And when you say the nonsense we're currently facing, uh, facing, so, uh, okay. And force rank the nonsense for me, if you would, then if, if we're looking at policy responses to climate change and we've heard repeatedly from this, the Biden administration, this is our main concern, right? And, you know, the president, in fact, at a League of Conservation Voters meeting at a at a high dollar fundraiser, I wrote about this on, on my Substack, bragged about the fact that the Export Import Bank of the United States was giving a $900 million loan to build a solar project in Angola. Never mind that 60% of the people who live in Angola don't even have electricity and we're building them a coal, a solar plant, not a coal plant, not a gas fired power plant, even though Angola has all kinds of natural gas. Okay, all this nonsense. So it, Force rank the nonsense. If you look at this survey of what our, our responses, our policy responses have been, what's the what's the silliest of the silly? Well, this rapid rush to wind and solar. I mean, that's the silliest of the silly. I mean, you know, it, I think it makes sense to think, to look forward, you know, into the 21st century and figure out how we can, you know, improve our energy infrastructure so that we have, you know, more abundant, cheaper, cleaner energy. And let's look forward and try to get there. I mean, that, that's just going to help support our progress in the 21st century. Um, that's going to require research and development and learning curves and it, different localities and countries experimenting. Uh, and, you know, at the by the end of the 21st century, if the market was left to, you know, take care of all this, we'd probably have a much better, cleaner um, energy infrastructure. But now that we're, <laughs> you know, tearing what we have down and replacing it with wind and solar, which is totally inadequate. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, we're, we're setting ourselves up to make ourselves more vulnerable to whatever weather or climate extremes nature might throw at us. I mean, electricity helps keep us safe <laughs> you know, with desalination plants and air conditioning and on and on it goes. Um, and it's also electricity is the source of our, you know, innovations across everything. So, I mean, what we're doing is extremely stupid and we've got politicians in charge of all this wind and solar stuff and nobody's talking to the engineers you know the people who who design transmission lines the grid operators you know they're all sort of tearing their hair out over all this wind and solar so what we're doing is just plain stupid and if we continue on this path we're going to end up in a worse place at the end of the 21st century than if we had just let market forces and our desire for innovation just to take charge and move forward. So it's just, it's a very bad place to be. Well, you are preaching to the choir, but amen, sister, keep going. Hallelujah. <laughs> Pass the collection plate. I'd boil that down. How I distill this is if, 
if 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 we're facing more extreme weather, it's the height of foolishness or the depth of foolishness to make our most important energy network dependent on the weather. I mean, we need weather <laughs> exactly. res, we need weather resilient systems, not weather dependent systems. And yet exactly. that is in fact what we're doing. And uh, just in the last few days here in Texas, it's been insanely hot and the wind and isn't the wind. blowing and, and the wind doesn't blow when it's really hot. And so there's been a, you know, wind energy, uh, we have a huge fleet of wind energy turbines and yet they're only producing at single digit percentage outputs during times of peak demand. So uh, anyway, I, I just had to, had to throw that in there. Um, okay. So let's talk about censorship because you, you also know a little bit about this. We talked, I think the last time you were on the podcast, which was in December of, of 2022, that in on Twitter, you, you were very pleased that Elon Musk had Elon Musk, took over Twitter because suddenly you got more traction there. You weren't being throttled. Your content wasn't being throttled. Is that still the case now? Do you, have you gotten more followers on Twitter? Tell me about how you see what's going on on just on that platform. And then we'll talk about other things. Okay. Well, just from my perspective, Twitter's going along great. I know a lot of people don't like it. Um, well, well, they don't like, you know, the climate scientists don't want to have the rabble questioning them and they don't like that and a lot of them are leaving twitter um also elon has made a couple of changes to the functionality tweet yeah. decks okay right. and, and a lot of people are very unhappy with that um so some people are leaving but this the overall you know from where i sit i think it's so much improved and you know, the quality of my interactions and the number of my followers has increased very substantially. So I'm happy. And I have to say that's the only social media platform that I'm happy with. Well, then let's talk about the others then. You were on John Stossel's uh, show and it was, uh, was it censored on Facebook? Tell me what, I've. this has been several okay, days on, ago or a couple Facebook. of weeks ago, but uh, on, yeah. on it, so it tell me about what happened. It was labeled as, um, false information. And this was me talking about my experiences and my perspective. So I don't know how you label this as false information. Um, so, and that was, you know, label, they still left the link where you could click there, but there was this big warning that this was false information because everybody knows that the consensus exists. 97% of climate scientists agree or whatever. You know, there's no debate. Um, I, I was on a um, podcast earlier this year uh, with the Heartland Institute. Right. Uh, and, and this was, it was live. And they, as soon as it started, they took it down. Facebook, and they Facebook were, did. Facebook. And they were sensitized to me because like about two weeks earlier, I there was a, something posted on YouTube. It was an interview by Biz News in South Africa. And it went sort of viral. I mean, it got like 500,000 views in a couple of days. And then YouTube took it down. You couldn't even search for it. Okay, you couldn't search for it at all. There was no message, no nothing. You couldn't search for it. So that must have raised some sort of flag to Facebook. So as soon as they saw me being a guest on the heartland podcast they just canceled that live feed and they you know so i'm being really canceled <laughs> you know by the mark zuckerberg type uh social media um so you know and and what i say if you actually listen to what i say is pretty innocuous i mean it it's not cheerleading you know for the team but you know i'm just raising some critical questions and that's very uncomfortable i mean i'm, I'm well outside that little box and that makes <laughs> people uncomfortable and they view me as a threat i mean all those footnotes in my book <laughs> you know it's like evidence sort of supporting my points and you know they view this as sort of dangerous well in the way you speak and what you're talking about it and Yes, as I've done, you know, a couple hundred podcasts and I'm a dad and, you know, been married a long time. I, I listen to how people listen to how they say what they're talking about. Right. The words matter, of course, but it's but there was the tone in your voice about um, 
how would I describe it? Disappointment, anger, frustration. How do I, here's the, I, you know, the, the TV journalist's favorite, how do you feel? How do when I say that? I'm just kind of joking about it, but I can sense of you a kind of an outrage or a, just a di disappointment. How, how does it make you feel? Well, you know, I'm a scientist, um, you know, and reason, dialogue, evidence, debate, and especially in universities, you know, debate and disagreement is the spice of academic life. And all that's been canceled. You know, it, it's the universities which disgust me um, even more than social media. I mean, social media is social media, but it's what's going on at the universities to me is the absolute worst. Um, I'm seeing a few of the universities turn around, but the overall tenor at universities is just, just terrible. And, you know, you, you saw this whole dynamics play out with the COVID situation. It's just endemic to our society right now. And it's, it's very dangerous. And it's free speech issue, uh, political freedom. You know, there's a lot of issues here. And unfortunately, a lot of this gets tied up in what's going on with Donald Trump. And, you know, th then it just becomes a big political mess. Um, but these are very serious issues. And I mean, how I mean. God bless Elon Musk for trying to open up Twitter. He has his own quirks um, and whatever. But overall, this is like the one place where people from across the spectrum still come and, you know, engage and look at, you know, a broad range of material. Um, everywhere else, or well, most other places, it's in a pretty sad state. How are we going to get anywhere if we don't <laughs> think critically and engage in constructive debate and discussion? You know, what you said about Twitter, I, I, I think we talked about this last time, but Alina Chan and Matt Ridley, who wrote a book uh, called Viral on the on COVID, they said the same things about the importance of Twitter in terms of this uh, opening the debate around origins of COVID. And now, which is clearly seems to be, as I think they suspected all along, a lab leak, right? Or the result of yeah. some kind of a lab leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, but they were being censored ever, almost everywhere else except on Twitter. And this is before Musk took over. But uh, that that lack of critical debate, uh, the the uh, free and open debate, I, I have to agree with you. And it, because the energy, we're messing with the most important system in our society, which is our energy network, and we're making it, we're weakening it, and spending hundreds of billions of dollars in the weakening of it, right? Because of the fashion of, and it is fashion, and the way I would talk about it, I guess uh, the the I, I call it climatism and renewable energy fetishism. Right. That we have this combined isms right there that are have replaced what has what I would call traditional conservation, conservation, the traditional conservation ethic. And that's one uh -huh. of the things that I'm with you exactly on wind and solar. There's this in, insane headlong rush toward these two sources of intermittent weather dependent renewables and with no regard for land use, birds, landscapes, view sheds. It's this, oh, well, this is the this is the cure. And therefore, anyone who stands in the way, we're going to run over. And it is almost that bold in terms of I mean, some of the states are even saying they're going to override local zoning laws to force communities to take wind and solar projects they don't want, which just seems the absolute wrong way to go in terms of democracy and process, due, due, due process and, 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 and so on. I, I know I'm 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 rambling here, but does that ring a ring ring true to you? Oh, for sure. You you summarized it perfectly. I mean, this is the, this whole thing is dangerous in so many different ways. I mean, not just to our energy infrastructure, but to our freedom and our the and the political way that we do things. I mean, it's it's a it's a very slippery slope that we're sliding down. You said, I wrote it down, you said the universities disgust me. And I, I reserve my disgust for a few things. Lima beans and cauliflower are two of them. But uh, <laughs> unpack that just a little bit for me. When you say they disgust you, why is that? Well, because of the, the, cancel, the cancel culture, um, all of the faculty members, you know, very talented people can't get hired because they don't know how to write a good DEI essay, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And if you're a chemistry <laughs> professor or something, what the heck, you know, when you're talking about molecules, how do you bring that into your teaching? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. Um, they're allowing students to 
basically lead the charge to get rid of faculty members that they don't like for some reason. They're um, interesting and provocative speakers are getting disinvited because some students feel threatened by their words and they, and they pander to this and they pander to this. Um, people who are sort of skeptical of climate change or um, in, in, gen, in biology and right. uh, all, all sorts of other fields. I, and it, I thought it was just really climate change and biology, but people tell me it's rampant in law schools in social psychology departments and political science departments. The, the same disease is rampant anywhere that there's a, that's socially relevant. Um, well, let me, let's, let, when you're talking about that, it, it makes me automatically think now of this held versus Montana lawsuit, which as I read the, <laughs> you slumped when I, when I brought it up, you were uh, an expert witness or were retained, I guess, as an expert witness in that case and ultimately did not testify. But when you were talking about the what's happening on the universities, the line that comes into my head is grievance culture, right? That everyone's aggrieved. Everyone is a victim. Somehow, some way they've been offended or their future has been been somehow clouded by this, that, or the other, that was in fact the claim, the legal claim that these teenagers made in Montana, that the state was, was injuring, them. injuring them and their potential, their future. And they won the court case under the, uh, what seemed to be a, a fairly narrow ruling based on the Montana constitution. I know you wrote a blog post about that in June, but now we're here after the Held versus Montana litigation that they won and the Montana uh, Attorney General said he's going to appeal. How do you read that decision and how important is it? Well, I don't think it's important. Um, it might stand because the uh, Montana Supreme Court seems to be equally clueless and sympathetic to these environmental claims as the, the judge. So I, I it may not be overruled. If it stands, it's not going to have a big material impact on what goes on in Montana in terms of changing, you know, the statute that they want to change because Montana in principle, I mean, it just adds a lot of paperwork to everything. Montana in principle can still approve new power plants. It may, it, it may end up slowing down <laughs> wind farms by the same token with all this extra paperwork. I don't know. But but it's a symbolic victory for our children's trust, which is the advocacy group behind this case. And it's given them fresh steam because they've been around for 10 years. And this is the first case where they got any kind of attraction. You know, they've been thrown out. Their cases have been thrown out everywhere until now. They're still pending in a few additional states, but this is the first traction that they've gotten. And to, to me, the most dangerous part of this is that like the state legal systems are ill-prepared, both the judges and, and the state's attorney's office to, to deal with an issue like this. I mean, a technical issue like this, it, it, these things should not be decided in the courts. Okay, they should be decided, you know, by the legislature, you know, elected legislators and they should have hearings from people across the spectrum and you know wide deliberate deliberations and whatever not by a single judge who's sympathetic to the defendants and doesn't have a clue about climate science and and, and the the montana state's attorney i mean i i was brought on the case at the last minute like last the end of last september and the the lawyer that hired me. Um, he then left a few weeks later. There was a private company who then took over, legal firm that then took over. And then the the lawyer who was eventually in charge of the case didn't even join it until December. And so he was <laughs> left, you know, brought in at the last minute. These weren't witnesses of his choosing. He didn't particularly understand the climate change issue at all. He wanted, you know, the case to be about something different, about legal nuances. Right. Uh, 
but in spite of my best efforts, I didn't convince them that this was really going to be about climate change and that you needed to deeply challenge their witnesses and, you know, the points. And he just didn't know how to evaluate any of that. And I don't blame him. I'm not surprised. I don't think there'd be very few um, lawyers in state's attorney's office who are prepared to handle a case like this. Um, because of the complexities extent. of the science, because of oh, the understanding, and, and understanding where the plaintiffs, uh, you know, where their weaknesses are. What, why is that? Is it the it, science it part of it? Oh, it's, it's both. I mean, and it's, um, and it's, it, they were claiming psychological injuries. You know, a few of them, oh, well, um, my roof was injured by a hailstorm and a barn on the neighboring property burned down from a fire and the stream dried up and I couldn't fish fish in the stream. And, you know, these were psychological injuries, but a lot of it was pre-traumatic stress syndrome. You know, the Greta Thunberg, we have no future, all of this kind of thing. So they're very deeply depressed. Um, so, I mean, the, the kids have been fed this insane rhetoric. The rhetoric targeted at, at kids and young adults is even worse than what we see you know, with Extinction Rebellion, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, they, they just don't have the critical faculties at this point to evaluate it. And a lot of them are depressed and upset, and whatever. But, <laughs> you know, we, we blame that on the education system, on the advocacy groups. I mean, if they were worried about the psychological injuries of the kids, they should have been suing Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg and the National Education Association, which is sort of feeding them all this stuff. But their real agenda is just to go after the fossil fuel companies um, and using kids as a prop. Um, so it's, a, you know, it, it's a case that made no sense. It's a legal decision that made no sense. Um, but like, it's not the first thing that makes no sense in all this. So, you know, th this is really, uh, I'm sure our children's trust is swimming in donations after this little victory, so they can go on and keep suing everybody. Um, I'm, you looking know, at their, I'm looking at one of the rundowns here that they've been, one of their funders is the Rockefeller Brothers, which is a, uh, uh, I don't know, there's some. Yeah, uh, oil. Yeah, some, Okay. So well, the Getty, the, the heir to the Getty fortune is funding um, Extinction Rebellion. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so you've got all of these oil company fortunes now funding all this craziness. Go figure. I want to reach back. You said that there is a a, a, a lot of anti-capitalist uh, rhetoric in this in these discussions. Um, talk about that, because I. I I believe I think you're right, and some uh, some of these uh, activists have been very clear about that. Right, that capitalism is the problem that's driving climate change, and therefore we need uh, some kind of Maoism or socialism or something that would replace it and have some kind of uh, authoritarian system. I, I it's the only thing I can imagine would be re the thing that would replace it. But uh, talk about why. How do you see that? How do you see this? Uh, and why do you say that it's an anti-capitalist movement? Well. Okay, well, if you look at the UN Environmental Program, which is, you know, really behind a lot of this UN stuff, and you read what they write, and it comes through loud and clear, and not just anti-capitalist, but anti-democratic. We can't trust the people or the countries to make the right decisions. So there needs to be, you know, more coercion from the top down at the international level from the UN. So it's, it's a grab for power. Um, so there's a lot of power grabbing in this and capitalism and democracy is inherently against, you know, centralized power. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, there, there are people who've written a lot about this. But so it's, the, the it's, solution it's, is somehow more coercion, more more authoritarianism from presumably the smart people over the dumb people, right, that they're going to be well, the ones I'm, that are going to make the decisions for us. Yeah, well, President Biden is talking about declaring a climate emergency, which would take, and it would be a long-term emergency. I mean, emergencies are for, you know, something going on two weeks or a month or a year, but not for something that's, you know, decades. So that would 
you know, force people to do this, force people not to do this, that would take away a lot of freedoms if he declares a climate emergency. And, you know, so there's a lot of power grabbing going on um, in the name of this issue. How do you describe your politics, Judy? Well, when, when I go to a ballot, um, I'm looking for the, you know, a, a voter's ballot. I'm looking for the none of the above box to check. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's my, my line i'm not a republican i'm not a democrat i'm disgusted and i am disgusted but i don't see a yeah. disgusted party so okay yeah i'm i'm um an independent with a, a libertarian streak um when i am totally disgusted with the republican and democratic candidates i'll vote libertarian by default but i haven't had any great enthusiasm for any of their recent candidates but um you know, I'm hoping no party or whatever, something can come up with something different because, you know, another Trump Biden election, you know, the whole country, you know, will just be tearing their hair out. Um, so, yeah, so I'm an independent. I'm a none of the above. I like to think things through and listen to both sides. And, you know, none of a lot of these issues are just not simple and there's, clashes of values so you know i like the discussion i like the debate um so i don't pledge allegiance to anybody or either side that's for sure i want to go back jump back to the the just stop oil crowd and the you know the climate rebellion people or whatever the, the extinction rebellion people because i find some of the these people who are throwing the soup cans and blocking the traffic and the rest of it i one, I, 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 for their punishment, I want them to go and live in rural Kenya with without any any hydrocarbons and be forced to stay there for two years and just tell us, you know, report back and maybe this has changed your mind. That's my that's my idea for punishment. You can't use any modern modern energy sources. Sorry, none, zero, and then see how you like it. But I also find it somewhat depressing when I look at them and how they feel the victim so they feel so aggrieved i mean there's something it, it, there's something dis deeply disgusting about it right because i think i see them also as just completely spoiled and and, and uneducated about the world around them but th there's something pathetic about them i, I it, does that does that ring true to you and i, I i'm just kind of riffing oh. here but i see something very um deeply well, sad in the way they act well it's part it's a part of the broader victim culture and identity yeah. politics you know it, it's the need Grievance to, culture it, victim culture right yeah. Yeah, yeah that that whole thing so it's it, it's it's a tribal thing um and the held lawsuit is part of this right that this is an oh, identity yeah, yeah, right yeah. this is an identity of oh we've been aggrieved we've been wronged and we're going to seek yeah. redress for this yeah. this and, this uh, affront to us and our 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 yeah, and then they have here. somebody in authority who's going to you know pay the bills for them to go out and throw you know cans of tomato soup um you know it seems like win win you know it, it they, they think they're saving the world um, they're part of a tribe and somebody's paying them and encourage, you know, somebody in authority who's paying them and encourage them to do this. So it's, you know, I think all of those things are contributing. Um, but it is very sad that these kids are doing something better with their time, more, more productive, um, you know, getting educated and getting jobs and, and this is Even, personal for you. You're, you're a grandmother, am I right? Do I oh, I'm a grandmother for sure. For how many? Sure. How many grandchildren? Well, I have one grandchild and then five step grandchildren. Uh huh. So, so we've got a nice crew, and they're all of junior high and high school age. And do you and talk so, about these kind of political issues with them? Oh yeah, oh yeah, and and they and 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 they think you know I'm cool because I'm a little bit subversive. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> good. See what Judy said, see what the real truth is. So, um, that they seem to all have healthy attitudes, you know, about the situation. And my granddaughter, who lives in Reno, you know, close to where I live, um, she, she, she she's very rational. She says, Well, I, I just really need to learn more about this whole issue. You know, I'm, I just I don't think I should have a big opinion about this right now because I just really need to learn more about this issue. I mean, I go, you go, girl. 
Yeah. So let me ask you about, uh, we just have a few more minutes. And again, my guest is Judith Curry. She's the author of this uh, new book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk, Rethinking Our Response. Uh, Buy the paperback. It's much cheaper than the hardback. It's out by Anthem Press. It came out in June. Um, I, I'm going to ask you about the ending of that uh, in, in just a minute. Um, but you have uh, your own website, judithcurry.com and climate, et cetera. Um, so you have your own media outlet. I'm just curious. Can you give me an idea how many visitors you get there? Because I'm increasingly convinced unless you own your own own media outlet, you're not assured of a free press. Uh, you know, I, I haven't joined Substack or anything else where I might get traffic. When I first started the blog, it had huge traffic. Um, I get less traffic these days. Mm. I think on a big day, I might get 10,000 visitors. Um, you know, it's it, and and if something gets picked up, you but know. that's still and, a respectable number. And, and uh, it, It's a respectable number. And, you know, I'm I'm not actually looking for influence. I'm just looking to engage in, you know, in the dialogue and to set up a space where people from across the spectrum can come here and discuss. And I also host a number of very interesting, intelligent people as guest um, authors. Um, And it's even spawned a few books, three books, in fact, you know, that have grown out from posts on my blog. No kidding. Uh, Yeah. And, And so, you know, I'm very happy with the blog, even though it's, you know, not high traffic. And in all honesty, I think my last, there, there was a three week period when I didn't even post something, <laughs> you know, so it's not like I'm posting four times a day and really trying to right. build traffic. You know, it, it's just my personal record of what I'm thinking about and what I'm investigating. And, and it really seeded my book. I started the blog in 2010 with a series on climate science and the uncertainty monster, which was a major theme in my book. Right. So, so this blog in many ways documented my journey in writing the book. It's an interesting way to think about it because I uh, talking with other writers and, you know, I'm, I've written six books and I don't know, don't think I have another one in them, but that they, they view the, their Substack or even their Twitter or other places in a way that they catalog what they know and then they can come back and use it as a resource. So I want to, uh, we're going to close here in just a few minutes because I know you're on a tight schedule and so am I. But at the end of the book, you have a section called Toward Post-Apocalyptic Climate Policies. And you quote the economist Richard Toll, who is an interesting character. I've met him once. He said, uh, politically correct climate change orthodoxy has completely destroyed our ability to think rationally about the environment. I touched on this before, but I, I, I like that because it speaks to the issues of land use, which I've been reporting on for a very long time and met many people in rural America in the course of my travels in Michigan and Wisconsin and all over the world that you know, are fighting these encroachment of these wind and solar projects. But it, it seems that that, to me, is the, the concrete example of this clouded ability to think about the environment, that this climatism has trumping all of these other concerns. Um I don't know. I, 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 you, you, in your, your book is in some ways kind of a technical book, but you also have these quotes that are really great in each section. So you really, you, that was the most fun part of the book was, um, I think, you know, selecting quotes and figuring out where to place them. I mean, it uh-huh. was, it was, it, I spent an awful lot of time doing it, but it was the most fun part really of writing the book. Well, I, I enjoyed it as well because uh, you, you have a you subdivided have the go ahead from Dirty Harry and Mae West <laughs> and you know <laughs> and, you know Bruce Lee you know popular culture figures along with philosophers and scientists and things like that. So, um, but it breaks up yeah. the kind of it made it less of a technical I, it, that gave it some leavening some some breathing room I guess I would say right because. You have a lot of technical things that heavily footnoted, footnoted, and and the way you structured it, in some ways, is more textbook like. And you said that the the publisher is targeting uh, universities and academic uh, outlets or academic buyers. But I, I found that part to be good. So let me read this one section here, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, this is in your concluding uh, section. You say. We need to open up space for dissent, disagreement, and discussion about scientific uncertainty and policy options so that multiple perspectives can be considered and broader support can be built for a range of policy options. Wicked scientists are willing to become embroiled in political debates and thorny social problems. 
To be effective, we need to break the hegemony of disciplinary researchers, uh, of disciplinary researchers, particularly for those who are strident political activists as being regarded as experts for solutions to the wicked problem of climate change. I couldn't agree with that more. I thought that was a really good summary of, I think, of what your your point is. We need we need more robust debate about the best path forward. And my thing has always been natural gas and nuclear. If we're serious about this, these are low carbon, scalable, you know, but they're just the lack of policy debate about what the way forward to me is very a very dangerous one. So uh, I, I commend you on the book. I thought, you know, it's really uh, obviously an enormous amount of effort. So I, I have to... Uh, wanted to uh, draw part of our discussion to an end there because I thought that was very well stated. So thank you for that. Thank Last two you. questions. And, you know, I, I, I asked these and I asked you these before. So what are you reading? What's on the, yeah, I know you're busy with climate forecast actions, uh, form, uh, climate forecast applications network, your business, uh, but I know you must be an avid reader. So what's on your bookshelf? What are you reading on these? Uh, what's the top of the pile? Oh gosh. Um, I wish I could remember the name of this book, but it's a book by Andy West. It's in the grip of culture. It's about the social psychology of climate catastrophism, um, you know, the Greta phenomenon or whatever. And this is another like scholarly book, but it's very readable. In, Actually, in the grip of culture, it's called? Yeah, in the grip of culture. Okay. Uh, I think, and it's about the social psychology of climate catastrophism. I see. Something okay. like that. So, so that's like... Um, I, I highly recommend that. Um, I think that's the main one I want to recommend at this point. Okay. Last question. What gives you hope? What gives me hope? Well, that, um, <clears throat> well, <laughs> people can be rational. And I think that we are in, I, I think this in the grip of culture book <laughs> explains a lot. And, you know, we, we just need to get out of that. And, I'm, I'm also, I mean, at some point, the weather is going to turn a little bit more favorable. We've been in a bad place since 2017. You know, the natural climate oscillations will shift at some point, five years, 10 years into a more favorable state. And hopefully people will calm down And about this problem. I, I think that the apocalyptic rhetoric people are realizing that they've gone too far. I mean, having a whole generation of kids who are depressed and too scared to do anything isn't going to help the movement. <laughs> so they have to figure out how to make their message a little bit more hopeful <laughs> and not just <laughs> destroy the psyches of all these kids. So hopefully the uh, catastrophic rhetoric will... Um, came down but you know rat you know at the end of the day things that don't make sense aren't going to have a long lifetime they can cost us a lot of money cause us a lot of pain but at the end of the day you know sense and economics will prevail but we're certainly not there right now well that's a good place to stop so that's where we will in fact stop my guest has been judith curry She's the author of a new book called Climate Uncertainty and Risk, Rethinking Our Response. You can find it, I'm sure, on all the major book selling outlets. She's on Twitter at CurryJA, and you can find her on the web at JudithCurry.com. Uh, Judith, thanks a million for coming back on the Power Hungry podcast. A, a very interesting book, and uh, uh, you know, I, I applaud you for efforts, at, uh, your efforts at trying to open up the debate. And with this, if these are the most important issues of our time, and I think they are important issues, Let's let's have a debate about it. Let's talk about it. Let's examine it. And your work, I think, is uh, is helping that effort. So good on you. OK, great. Thanks. It was great to talk to you again. OK, so thank you, Judy. And thanks to all of you out there in uh, podcast land. T tune in to the next episode of the Power Hungry podcast. It might be as good as this one. We will find out. But uh, if you have a chance, also give us a good rating on those uh, podcast outlet, wherever you can give us four, five, six, 12 stars, whatever it is. And until next time, see ya.